Parts A and B of this problem will require a bit of dimensional analysis. That means that we'll need to take the units of each component in the formula to figure out what the units of the individual variables should be. More specifically, the problem tells us that x is in meters, and since x is on its own on one side of the equation, that means that x is, has units of meters. But it also means that, C, that, the, that ct squared minus bt cubed should also have units in meters, since the units should be equal on both sides of the equation. This also means that each individual term should have those same units as well. For the case of part A, we're asked to find the units of C, when C is in the term that is ct squared. This entire term must have units of meters. And we often represent units in dimensional analysis with these square brackets. Not always, but that's the notation I've seen a lot. Now, right now, we don't know the units of C, but we do know the units of T squared, since, once again, the problem tells us that T is in seconds. So this T term should have units of seconds, but then it's being squared. So if I were to break down the units of this term more thoroughly, we'd have the units of whatever c is, I'll leave that empty for a moment, multiplied by the units of t squared, which is just going to be second squared. Now think about it like this. Dimensions work the same way that you would expect like other numbers and values to work when it comes to math, like multiplication and division. Now we can see that whatever the units are of c, is being multiplied by s squared, but there's no s squared in the in the net dimensions. Like the, the, the dimension for the full term should just be meters. There shouldn't be seconds in there at all, which means that whatever the units of c must be, they have to be canceling out the s squared in some way. So whatever the units of c are will likely have s squared in the denominator so that the terms can cancel out. There also must be a meter term in there somewhere, because this meter has to come from somewhere, so it makes sense to put it in the numerator. From this, we can see that the units of c make the most sense when written as meters per second squared, because if those are the units, then the second squared cancel out with the second squared of the t squared term, and all we're left with is the meter, which makes sense because the term as a whole should have dimensions of meters. So this will be our dimensions for C. We'll use the same logic for part B. We're asked about the units of constant B, and in the equation we're given, we have a term that says bt cubed. We'll use the same logic. We know that this full term must have units of m, meters, and that the t, since it has units of seconds, will be, will be multiplying whatever the unit of B is, times uh, t to the power of 3, or seconds cubed. Now these seconds cubed are not in the meter term that we're trying to equate this to, so I'll put seconds cubed in the denominator, since if they're in the denominator of b's units, then that's how the seconds will be cancelled out. Following the same logic as above, I'll also put a meter term in the, in the numerator. Once again, following the same line of logic, it appears as though the units of B are meters per second cubed. Part C asks us about the time at which the particle reaches its maximum x position. Now this is an optimization problem, which will require some calculus. In a nutshell, if you're, whether or not you're familiar with calculus, in a nutshell, that just means that if we want to maximize a function, we have to take the derivative of that function and set it equal to zero. So I'll take the derivative of the position formula, which is just velocity, since that's how velocity is defined, and it's a pretty simple derivative. We're taking the derivative with respect to t, so we'll just use some basic calculus here using the power rule. So this ct squared term just becomes 2ct, And this bt cubed term becomes 3bt squared. And remember that we're setting this equal to 0 in order to maximize the function, the position function, that is. 
Now the problem is asking us to find the time at which the function is maximized. So we need to find the value for t at which this equation is true, that this equation is equal to zero. So first, let's add 3bt squared to both sides of the equation. Next, one of the t's will cancel out. Technically, the equation becomes true if t is equal to zero, but we're ignoring that spot because we're looking for a maximization. Uh, the particle's not going to have reached its maximum position at t equals zero, since it hasn't even moved yet. Now let's solve this for t by dividing both sides of the equation by 3b. So now we've got this basic little formula to tell us what t is uh, depending, based on what the constants c and b are equal to. Now the problem tells us to let the numerical values for c and b respectively be 3.0 and 2.0. So we'll plug 3.0 for c and 2.0 for b. If we do this, we find a time value of 1.0 seconds. Now parts d and e can be a little confusing. We're asked to find the distance that the particle has moved by 4 seconds um, in part D, and then part E asks about the displacement. Uh, first, let's just go in order. Let's just start with part D. Since the distance, since solving for the distance that the particle has moved is a little more involved, think carefully about what exactly is happening here with this particle that's moving. The particle starts at the, the origin of the x-axis, and starts moving in the positive direction. But, as we established in the previous part, part C, the moment that the particle has been traveling in the positive direction for 1.0 seconds, it has reached its maximum position. That means that after this point in time, the particle is going to be traveling in the negative direction. What this means is that the particle is not just traveling in one direction the entire time. It's going to move a little bit for one second in one direction, and then it's going to switch directions. This is relevant because we need to take this into account when calculating the particle's total distance traveled. We can't just plug in 4.0 seconds into the formula that we've found for the distance, because the only thing that this equation tells us is the distance of the particle from the origin, from its starting position, at that point in time. It's not going to give us the total distance, because the equation itself doesn't account for moments where the particle moved back and forth, or retreaded old ground, the way that this particle does in this case. So we'll need to break the equation down a bit. Since we know that the equation since we know that the particle will be reaching its maximum position in the positive direction at 1.0 seconds, let's first just plug in 1.0 seconds into this equation to find out how far the particle has traveled by that point. If we take 1.0 seconds and plug it into the position formula using the given constants for c and b, 3.0 for c and 2.0 for b, then we should find a distance or a displacement at 1 second of exactly 1.0 meters. That's only part of the equation. That's only part of the problem, though. Keep in mind, the particle is going to travel one meter to the right in the positive direction, but then it's going to travel backwards, back to the origin, that same exact distance, before continuing to travel in the negative direction for however long. Let's next plug in 4.0 seconds for, for the position formula. If we do this, again using the same constants, we find, a dis we find a distance from the origin of 80 meters, negative. Which means that at this point, at the point of 4.0 seconds, it is now negative 80 meters from its starting position. This means that throughout the particle's entire motion, it has traveled 1 meter to the right, or 1 meter in the positive direction, then traveled 1 meter back to the origin, and then continued traveling that far, 80 meters to the left, or 80 meters negatively. Since part D is asking for the total distance that the particle has moved, we need to add these three parts together. So the total distance that it's traveled will be 1 meter plus 1 meter plus the 80 meters, which of course adds up to a total of 82 meters. So in total, the particle has traveled 82 meters. Part E is similar, but slightly different, in that it is only asking for the particle's displacement from its starting position at the point of 4 seconds. 
Now really, the displacement is what the equation tells us. The equation we're given for position just tells us the distance that the particle has moved from its starting spot, which, as we calculated, is going to be 80 meters, well, negative 80 meters to be exact. If we were to put in 4.0 seconds for the position function, we get negative 80 meters, meaning that the particle has moved negative 80 meters from its starting position by the end of its motion. In other words, this part is a little simpler because negative 80 meters is just going to be our final answer because that alone is enough to tell us the displacement the particle has moved from its starting spot. Parts F, G, H, and I are all kind of redundant with each other since they basically ask the same simple thing just to find the velocity at these specific times. Now way back in part C, we already found a function for the particle's velocity by taking the derivative of the position function. All we need to do for these next four parts is to take this exact formula and just plug in the different values for t, once again using the same constants, 3.0 and 2.0. If you do this properly, you should get 0 meters per second for one second, for an input of 2.0 seconds, a velocity of negative 12 point meters per second, for 3.0 seconds, negative 36 meters per second, and for 4.0 seconds, negative 72 meters per second. For the next four parts, the final four parts of the problem, in fact, we're asked about the same inputs, but this time for acceleration. Now, we have not found an acceleration function yet, but we can do so pretty simply by taking the derivative of our velocity function. Once again, it's a fairly simple derivative, just using the basic power rule. So this 2ct term just becomes 2c. And this negative 3bt squared term just becomes negative 6bt. Now we just take the inputs that the problem gives us in parts k, uh, j, k, l, and m and put it into this formula, once again using the same constants for c and b. Once again, if plugged into your calculator and done properly, you should get an acceleration of negative 6.0 meters per second squared for an input of 1 second, negative 18 meters per second squared for 2 seconds, negative 30 meters per second squared for 3 seconds, and negative 42 meters per second squared for 4 seconds. And that's just about everything there is to know about this a very long and multi-part problem. I hope this video helped you. If you have any further questions, please feel free to leave a comment below asking for clarification, or you may join my Discord server, which I have linked in uh, the channel description, where you can speak to me directly and ask for help or, or even make suggestions or requests for future videos. Thank you and have a nice day.